the latest news. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. In the mounting fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on ever greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and the millions of people who live around this greatest sea. The drama of the peoples whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here, as another public service, is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. The Ryukyu Islands. Yes, sir. There's Okinawa below us, on the left. Yes, sir. It's a long, skinny island, ain't it? We'll be over our target in a couple of minutes. Are you ready? I'm your man, sir. I could feel my throat getting dry, the muscles in my stomach tightening up as we flew over Okinawa. That island down there and all the other islands of the Ryukyus around it were full of Japanese. Lieutenant Reed. Yeah, Joe. They're opening up with anti-aircraft down there. Yeah. I've got an idea we're going to see some enemy fighters pretty soon. Oh, what do you care, Joe? You're the best gunner in the squadron. He was, too. But I knew as well as he did that we were getting over the hot spot of Okinawa. We had a bundle of bad news in the shape of a bomb in our belly, and our job was to take it down and lay it on an oil tank. Lieutenant, they're getting close to us, sir. Here we go, Joe. We're going in. Call them off. Yes, sir. 7,000, 6,000, 5,000, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000. Here we go. We got it, sir. We got it. Okay. Let's go home. Joe. Joe, you all right? An anti-aircraft burst equipped us somewhere in the stern section back where Joe was. Joe? Joe, are you all right? He didn't answer. The ship began to flop around in the air like a wounded bird. Part of my control had been shot away. I struggled to stay in the air. Joe? Joe, can you answer me? Answer me if you can, Joe. Oh! Oh, Lieutenant, I'm hit. I'm hit. Bad? Yeah, my leg is in my right leg. is bleeding. I... I can't move it. Take your tablets, Joe. We're heading back for the carrier. We'll be there in no time now. Yeah. Yeah, I know, Lieutenant. We were heading up the coast, northward, along the eastern shore of Okinawa. I tried to bring her around to head eastward, back toward the carrier, but she fluttered and shuddered and skidded. We were losing altitude. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Reed. Yes, Joe. There's enemy planes diving on a Zeke. Can you man that gun, Joe? I'll try. Are you all right, Joe? Yeah, sure, but I think I winked him. Here comes another. Get him, Joe. Lieutenant. Lieutenant, I think he cut off part of our tail. Didn't hit you, did he, Joe? No. We're going down. Hang on, Joe. We're going in. I'll try to put her down flat. She snapped over on her back when we hit the water. It threw me out. When I came to, I looked for Joe. I found him half submerged under the tail. Pegged him up into the oh, rubber boat. Oh, oh. His leg had been shattered by that burst of flak. Oh. He pointed to his chest. Uh, uh, something, something here. He had a great bruise across his chest. I oh. felt of it. I was afraid to believe what I thought. Some of his ribs were broken at least. Oh. Maybe his chest was crushed. Oh, oh Tony, you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right, Joe. Hey, hey, your face is bleeding. Hmm? Oh, I'm all right, Joe. Nothing but a scratch. Yeah, but you better take care of that gas, sir. Oh, oh. We drifted toward the island. I could see the high cliffs in the haze. That was the northern end of Okinawa, I knew. If the waves washed us in there, we'd be smashed up in the surf against those cliffs. 
So maybe that was better than falling into the hands of the Japanese. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. We drifted toward the island. I gave Joe my tablets, knocked him out. I fixed up his leg as best I could. It was pretty bad. I couldn't do anything for his chest. The waves washed us in toward the cliffs. But instead of being carried right into the surf, a current caught us and carried us along the shore southward. In my notebook, I wrote down everything I saw. The terrain of the island, the reefs, the rocks, the shoals, all that. I figured that sometime the information might be valuable. We drifted for days, I don't know how many. Why the Japanese didn't spot us, I don't know. The next thing I knew, we were on the beach with the waves washing up over us in the rubber boat. And an old French priest bending over us. Here. Here. Let me help you up. Uh, uh. Oh. Who? Who are you? I am Father Fenelon. I am a missionary. Where are the Japanese? What island is this? This is Okinawa. Are you hurt? Oh, no. No, I'm all right. I tried to stand up. I fell down. He helped me up. Then as the confusion in my mind cleared, I saw Joe. He was lying in the bottom of the boat. This man, is he badly hurt? Yes, yes, he's badly hurt. Joe. Joe, we're on land, Joe. Uh, he needs a doctor. Here. Help me to get him out. Yeah. Uh, easily. Very easily. Uh. Joe. Joe, this is Reed. We're on land. We're going to get help for you. Joe. Joe never came to. He died there on the beach. Father Fenelon bowed and crossed himself. I just stood there. We will left to bury him here in the sand so that the Japanese will not know. Else they will search for you until they find you. It was twilight. We waited until it was dark. Then we buried Joe. When we were done, I just stood there and looked out over the sea. This was a Japanese island, the island where I stood, Okinawa. There were thousands and thousands of Japanese on it. Come. Come with me. I had almost forgotten about Father Fenelon. I will take you to my house. Toward nightfall of the second day, I started to piece together what had happened, where I was. I was lying on a low bunk in a small, half-dark room. Outside, I could hear voices. Japanese. I wondered if Father Fenelon was going to turn me over to them. Yes? Father Fenelon? American friars have been reported on the island. You will notify the command post of any American friars that you see. Yes, Sergeant. Father Fenelon brought me food. He dressed my wounds. He made no effort to talk to me. As I grew stronger, I wanted to get out. It would only mean that you would be taken, Monsieur Reed. This island is an armed camp. I knew he was right. Do you realize where you are? You are only 400 miles from Japan. In the days that followed, he drew a map for me. It was a map of the entire Ryukyu chain of islands, stretching from Japan like a necklace all the way down to Formosa. He knew all of the islands, particularly Okinawa, for he'd been here for 35 years. You see, Okinawa is the largest of all the islands. Up to the north end here, there are bold cliffs going right down to the water. Yes, I've seen them. This whole north end of Okinawa is rugged and hilly. And down here at the south end, here is 
where you landed, right here. The terrain is very low. It goes right down to the water. Uh, well, where are we? Oh, we are right here. And uh, right across the island from us on the west shore is Naha. Oh, yeah, I remember seeing that on the chart. Naha is the biggest city in all the Ryukyus. How big is it? I should say about, uh, about 65,000 now. Do you ever go over there? About once a year. Before the war, I used to walk the length and breadth of the island. But now that there are so many soldiers and sailors here, no, no more. Okinawa was a good-sized island. Oui, it is some 60 miles long, and it varies from 2 miles wide to 16 miles wide. But I have walked every foot of it. How far is it across the island from here to Naha? No, about five miles. Monsieur Reed, the best thing you can do is to stay here, inside this house. I wrote down everything he told me in my notebook. Through the long days, while he was out in the field or over in the village, I tried to figure out where the military installations were. Once, I was surprised. Looking out between the blinds, I could see the same Japanese sergeant who had warned Father Fenelon about the presence of American flyers. Father Fenelon? Father Fenelon, are you here? He is usually here at uh, this time of day. He may be taking a nap. I will look in this room. You look in that room. Yes. As the sergeant came into the room, I hid behind the open door to the closet. I held my breath. Nothing in here. He must be over in the village. We will come back. I told Father Fenelon about the visit. He said nothing. I asked him if he liked the Japanese people. I understand him. Why don't you turn me over to them? I understand you, too. I am not concerned with who rules these islands. I am concerned with the soul of men. He turned and walked away. I thought about him a long time. Whenever I asked questions, he answered them. There are 55 islands in the Ryukyu chain, and they stretch over an area of 935 miles. I wrote these figures down. Father Fenelon, how many people are there in these islands? There are probably 800,000. 800,000? Much more densely populated than the islands of the southwest Pacific. Yes. About how many live here on Okinawa? I would judge about, uh, oh, 400,000. I wanted to ask him how many Japanese soldiers and sailors were on the island. But I thought better of it. That would have to wait. the days, I heard airplanes overhead. I got so that I could distinguish the various types of planes by their sounds. At night, in the dark, I would sometimes slip out in the back of the house, breathe the clear night air, look up into the sky. On bright nights, I could make out some of the low-flying planes. Some of them were seaplanes. That meant there was a seaplane base there. I was standing in the shadow of a banana tree in the dark when I saw two Japanese passing behind the house not 20 feet away. I said nothing. Good evening, Father Fenelon. I turned slowly, walked through the shadows back into the house. He did not hear us. He is getting very old, and his hearing is bad. I stayed close within the house for several days after that. At night in the dark, Father Fenelon and I would talk. He knew little about the war. He knew about Pearl Harbor, but he knew nothing about the Battle of Midway, nor the Battle of the Coral Sea, nor about Guadalcanal. He didn't know that we'd retaken New Guinea and Palau, and that we were in the Philippines. Yes? Yes? That's all he'd say. I asked him a thousand questions about the Ryukyus, about Okinawa particularly. For a thousand years and more, kings and conquerors fought for the control of these islands. That is why they have so many names. Yeah, I know. They're also called the Luchus. Yes, and the Nancy Islands. Many Chinese came to live here and to mix with the island people. 
But the Japanese have been coming here for many years, too. And at last, they have come to have more power here than the Chinese. And your American Commodore Perry came here, too. Here to the Ryukyus? Yes. It was it's his purpose, purpose to, to establish... establish an American naval base here in the Ryukyus. And another base in the Bonin Islands. Still another in Formosa. American naval bases so close to Japan will have a salutary effect upon Japanese-American relations and will influence Japan's thinking in regard to American rights in these waters. This will give America a strong, a strong position, position in, in this, this part of the Pacific. But the United States government would not listen to Commodore Perry, and so America lost her opportunity. The Ryukyus at that time belonged to no nation, but the eyes of the Japanese were upon them. I read the English books Father Fenelon had on his shelves and tried to read the French ones, but I didn't get very far. I read the accounts he had written on the Ryukyus. He wrote about the resources of the islands, the manganese, the sulfur, the quinine. He wrote about the rice they raised, the barley and millet, about the tobacco, timber, and bananas. And I made notes about it all in my notebook. But I even grew tired of this. It was as if I were a prisoner in a cell. I didn't know how many thousands of Japanese there were around me, but I wanted to get out. Those are tanks, Monsieur Reed. And infantry. There must be a lot of them here. He didn't say anything. Tanks and infantry rumbled by for a long time. I looked at Father Fenelon. He was just sitting there, not an expression on his face. Father Fenelon, how long have the Japanese had the Ryukyus? Since 1874. And by the time I got here in 1909, these islands had virtually become a province of Japan. And Naha became their capital. Naha? It must be quite a city. It is the chief port of Okinawa. I'd like to see that city. He didn't say anything. It's only five miles. Yes. He got up and walked away. After our supper of sweet potatoes and fish and millet, he walked over to me in the darkness. Monsieur Reed, every man must do what his conscience tells him he must do. I think we understand each other. I am going down to the village now. I shall be back in an hour. I watched him go. Then I sat there in the dark, thinking. Could I stand to be cooped up in that house until the war was over? Even if I could, could I hope not to be discovered? If I were discovered, what would the Japanese do to Father Fenelon? How could I possibly get off the island? Where could I go? To Naha? I turned the thought over in my mind. Maybe in Naha, somehow. I decided to go. I would leave a note for Father Fenelon thanking him. No, some Japanese might walk in and find it. I gathered together the few belongings I had, slipped out into the dark. I made my way through the great dark masses of Sago. The moon was clear overhead. I headed westward, directly across the island on the western shore toward Naha. I decided to walk until dawn and then sleep in the daytime and go on toward Naha the next night. With each step, I was fearful I would bump into a Japanese. When dawn started to break, I was atop a hill covered with pine trees. The rolling country below was almost like southern Wisconsin, where I was born. I could see cows and horses in the fields. I crawled in under the foliage of a fallen tree and went to sleep. Mm -hmm. 
I was awakened by the voices of Japanese. I lay still. It seemed my heart was louder than their voices. At last, I crawled slowly out. A hundred yards away was an anti-aircraft gun concealed in the trees. The crew was working around it. I crawled back, waited until dark. Just at nightfall, I heard a rustling in the brush. It was approaching me. Perhaps I was discovered. I didn't move, but I strained my ears. Suddenly, there was a break as if it were rushing me. I looked up. A wild boar was charging past me, not ten feet away. Disappeared into the woods. When it was dark, I started walking. I made my way around a large airfield. I made notes on everything I could see. When daylight came, I was outside Naha. I climbed to a height overlooking the city. I looked down at the harbor. I took out my notebook and made a sketch of it. In the outer harbor were 17 ships. Six cargo ships, three transports, two cruisers, four destroyers. A vessel that looked like a submarine tender and some seagoing tugs and smaller boats. Out beyond, there were coral reefs. I counted three passages into the harbor. This was a major fleet anchorage. There must be repair shops and docks and a supply depot. I waited until dark, and I started out to locate them. The docks were equipped to service almost any size ship, and the supplies that were being unloaded from the ships were being reloaded on trains that carried them back into the island. Down the shore, I heard a roar. A big seaplane was taking off. This is where those seaplanes came from. I could see the ramps leading down into the water. This was a seaplane base. A group of Japanese soldiers in fatigue uniform approached. I crept under a canvas tarpaulin that was covering a great pile of cases. About 25 feet away, they threw back part of the tarpaulin and started to move their cases away on hand trucks. They threw the tarpaulin back as they worked toward me. I lay there, my heart thumping. A distant air raid siren was screaming. It meant our guys were coming back. I lifted the canvas and peeked out under it. Not a Japanese was there. Just then I saw one of our dive bombers. He planted it smack on the cruiser. At a boy. They almost yelled with joy. The bombs were falling around me like hail. They were after the ships and the docks. I just lay there. raid went on for nine hours. There must have been four or five hundred planes up there during that time. After about five hours of it, I started to get out. I was no good dead. If I could get the information I had out of the island and back to the right people, maybe I could do some good. I knew that our guys would be back. In the dark, I made my way out of Naha and back into the hills. I lived on bananas and raw sweet potatoes and cucumbers. I found some chicken eggs and I ate them, raw. And I made notes on everything I saw. The two seaplane bases, the installations around the port of Naha, the inland airfields, the supply depots, the highlands and the railroads. I made detailed sketches 
I spotted their exact locations on my map. I looked up and I saw our guys heading back for Naha. The woods around me were full of anti-aircraft guns. I made my way northward, up the middle of the island, and then cut across the east coast. I sat there looking down at the sea. Down there along that shore, Joe and I had been battered in our rubber boat, carried along by the current. I could only get out. Maybe Father Fenelon might somehow help me. I started southward for his house. I remembered what we had been told about Okinawa and the rest of the Ryukyus. Japanese have for years discouraged visitors to the Ryukyus. That is why so little is known about them. But strategically, they are of enormous importance. They command the approaches of the mainland of China. The Ryukyus are part of the screen of Japanese islands that extend from the Kurils down to Formosa. The Ryukyus are shut off from the Yellow Sea, and they control our access to the coast of China. They are heavily fortified. And... There are many small harbors in the Ryukyus, and since the chain is nearly 800 miles long, that gives the Japanese a strong barrier which we must break through if we are to reach the coast of China in that quarter. Therefore, it's of the greatest importance for you. I could hear Japanese talking in the distance as I slipped through the shadows around to the back door of Father Fenelon's house. There was no answer. Father Fenelon was not home. I lay down on the bunk in the dark to wait for him. When I awakened, I saw Father Fenelon in the light of a lamp, reading my notebook. You have seen much, Monsieur Reed. Yes. Are you all right? Yeah. Where did you get my notebook? It was there, on the floor, beside the bunk. Here it is. Thanks. You may have my notebook, too, the one I have been keeping all these years. Was it possible that he did not know why I was gathering all this information? Do you mean, Father Fenelon, that I can take it with me? You are going away? Will you help me? You can never get away, Monsieur Reed. While you were gone, every house was searched by the soldiers. They know that some American flyers have come down in each of your heads. They will come back here again. I could think of nothing to say. But uh, perhaps I could get your notebook out and mine. If the notebooks got out, it wouldn't matter about me. Can you really get them out, Father Fenelon? I can try. And now I make this last notation in my notebook. I have set down here all that has happened and all that I have found out about the Ryukyu since Joe and I first flew over Okinawa. I put this notebook now in the hands of Father Fenelon. Perhaps he can get it out, and with it his own notebook, which should be of more value than mine. Why he should do this, I do not know. If he succeeds, perhaps eventually this information will be brought to the attention of the right people. been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. The principal voice was that of Marvin Miller. This program came to you from Hollywood. 
This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> 